so thank you. All right, well, we're going to get to the far more important stuff uh, now. I'm going to do a 30 second to minute review of Acts 19, and then we will jump into Acts 20 together. About what, about five weeks ago or something, we started looking at Acts 19, which when Paul went to Ephesus. And what book was then written to these folks? Ephesians. And we'll learn what other books were written to them in just a few minutes. But if you remember, Paul talked to them about the Holy Spirit baptism, and they talked about how they had received John's baptism. And in response, he said, baptism with the Holy Spirit. And he went on and he did miracles there. But whenever Paul did miracles, what often followed them? persecution you can use whatever word you want to use but the minute he started doing things in the name of jesus there were usually jews sometimes gentiles but often jews that got in an uproar and so at first the jews got in an uproar over what paul was doing in ephesus and then if you remember there was a uh, what was it a metal worker or whatever a blacksmith named what demetrius see it's been five weeks man we might have to, let's just go back to acts one and let's just start and but named Demetrius and uh, he was a metal worker of silver and such and he built shrines to the god goddess Artemis and remember because G uh, Paul was proclaiming about Jesus being the one true God not only did the Jews get mad at Peter but also those who the Gentiles whose business he was interrupting and so there was a big giant riot that happened and they all threw Paul and his companions in there and Paul wanted to speak to them and his companions kind of said I don't think so pulled him back out of there and then they just kind of escaped out of the way and here we are now uh, in Acts chapter 20. Now remember, he had spent <clears throat> a long time in Ephesus. Years and years and years. I believe it was at least three years. It may have been more in Ephesus. So he had traveled among the people. They knew him. It's kind of like if somebody new came to our church and they were a part of everything we did for the next three years. <clears throat> we wouldn't just know them by face. Most of the time we'd really know them, right? If they were getting involved in all the different things our church was doing. <clears throat> And so we're going to start in Acts chapter 20. When the uproar ended, the uproar we just talked about, Paul sent for the disciples. And after encouraging them, <coughs> excuse me, he said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. Now, <coughs> my throat's dry. Now, before, before we go any farther, Paul is leaving for Macedonia, and he is now going to be leaving Ephesus, and he will never be there again. This is he's leaving there, and his trip will never bring him back around through there. But there are four different writings written to the church in Ephesus. Uh, Valerie mentioned one of them, Ephesians. Can anybody in your vast Bible knowledge know the other ones written to the church in Ephesus? Corinthians was written to Corinth. Corinth, good try. It's the area, but, but no, Ephesus is different. Yep. Timothy, which one, first or second? Both was the correct answer. Very good, very good. So, what's that? Teacher's pet, very good. I'll give you a water. No. <laughs> that are my keys, that's all I got. And so I'm not sure which is worth more, but... um. First and second Timothy were because Paul loved them so much. He sent one of his top men, Timothy, back to these churches to minister. And that's why Paul will write first and second Timothy, because he'll write to that, write to Timothy to show him how to handle a lot of the church struggles. If you remember in Timothy, he talks about how to set up elders and presbyters and, and all these things to set up church government properly so these churches can function and run well. Now, there's one more letter written to the church in Ephesus. It's a little trickier, but at, at the same time, as soon as I say it, you'll get it. Can anybody think of it? I'll let you sit in the front row on Sunday. No, I'm just kidding. That's not exactly enticing. Nice try, but no. <laughs> Philippians, no. In fact, it wasn't even written by Paul at all. There's a hint. First John, no. <laughs> Why don't I help you out, okay? 
uh, it starts with an R. Revelation, exactly class, very good. Revelation chapter 2, if you go there, it says, to the church in Ephesus. Now this is fascinating for us, because this, this, part, this part of Revelation was written approximately 30 to 40 years after Paul ministered there. So it's kind of like if somebody could write a letter to the church of Christ, to Christ Church Jacksonville Anglican, forty years from now, and we could get a, a sense of what the church is going to look out look like four decades from now. So Paul was there. Paul had set up house churches. People had been on fire for God. He talked about being baptized with the Spirit. All kinds of great things were happening. Remember, he taught day in and day out to the people, and this wonderful Christian presence was developing. This is what we read Jesus saying through John's revelation, well, the revelation of Jesus Christ through the writings of John, to in, Acts, in Revelation 2. To the church of Emphasis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. These are the words of Jesus Christ who holds the power of the Spirit. I know your deeds, you, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you can't tolerate wicked men and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but they're not, and have found them false. And you've persevered and endured hardships and not grown weary. Now that's good, isn't it? That's a good tombstone epitaph, right? To have on there. But then Jesus says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. And the concept here is if and all of us, I'm sure, whether it was on a bike or on a car or a motorcycle or a truck, have had a tire that had the tiniest hole in it. And over a few days or a few weeks, it would shrink back, you know, it would go down and you had to pick it to the gas station or you buy one of those, uh, what are they called? What do we buy, Rachel? I don't know. We buy donuts all the time, but that's beside the point. What's it called, Rachel? Air compressor, all right, uh, and to blow the tire back up. But no matter how many times you blow it back up, what's going to happen? Until it's either fixed or you replace it, it's going to go flat. And the idea of losing your first love is not that one day you woke up in love with Jesus and the next day you're like, nah, change my mind. No, it was this small little letting out of, if I could use the metaphor, spiritual air from our, from our souls, where we just allowed the presence of Jesus to pour out and not get refilled <clears throat> by him. And that's what he's referring to. So you have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first, <clears throat> or else I will come and remove your lampstand, representing his presence in the church. So <clears throat> the church in Ephesus was holding on, but they were really struggling 40 years after Paul. And though I don't know this for certain, one of the preachers I, I tend to follow, he said that they had taken a trip to Ephesus and that the church remnant there is almost non-existent there anymore. Not that there aren't any Christians, but that there is no thriving Christian community in Ephesus, from what he said. <clears throat> and so, again, don't hold me to that part, but that was just what he shared. And so that's what can happen if we allow that slow leak to come out over and over. So we'll move on here in verse 2. He traveled through the area, Paul did, speaking many words of encouragement to the people and finally arrived in Greece where he stayed three months because the Jews, Jews had made a plot against him just as they were about to sail for uh, Syria. He decided to go back to Macedonia. Now real quick, we're going to learn that Paul's heart was to go to Jerusalem from this point in his life. In the previous chapter, Acts 19, <coughs> Acts 19, uh, verse 21, it says, After all that happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem after passing through Macedonia. Now, something to think about. Why would Paul, from where he was stationed in Ephesus, go to Macedonia, which is to the west, when Jerusalem was to the east? He had just left that area, so why would he go all the way over here and then go over there? Doesn't make any sense, does it? What's that? Plots against him certainly held him where he was at. Anyone else? 
ships. He stayed for three months. A lot of people believe that the, the timing of the oceans and the waters may have played a role into that. That's very good. I didn't think anyone picked that up. Good job. That Mountain Dew helped you out today, brother. That's it. He had a Mountain Dew for the first time in his life. If Casey seems extra aglow with the spirit. Right, at that time of year, there were not a lot of ships sailing going on. And so he's probably just waiting for the best moment. A few other reasons is because we're about... Well, the Lord may have told him to go back there. In fact, I would argue that he did, although he doesn't say so exactly, because he knew that he was taking a collection from the churches to the west for Jerusalem, an offering for the home church in Jerusalem. And so he, you're going to find over the first part of this chapter, there's going to be a lot of names and it's going to seem a little bit dry. But what they're explaining is that church leaders from each of these different sections of churches that we have been reading about for a while that Paul traveled to are all going to meet with Paul. They're going to be kind of the designated people to bring the offering to the people in Jerusalem. It's almost as if, assuming there's no modern banking methods or internet or anything, if I went back to Pennsylvania for a little bit and on my way back, I met up with different Christians I knew and they all came with me because they wanted to give a financial gift to Christ Church. Amen? That's something to pray for. That No, but that would be nice. That, it's that concept that they wanted to come and physically represent their church with the gift they wanted to offer to the believers in Jerusalem. Okay? And we see a little bit of this, more, my experience, I should at least say, has been more in, in the uh, black church, where sometimes you can be in church, and if it's a smaller church especially, they might say, uh, my brother, uh, my brother, uh, or I brought my friend Matt, and I would stand up and I'd say, I bring you greetings from Christ Church Jacksonville Anglican, and I would just sit back down, and they, it was just this kind of something that sometimes happens in at least smaller black churches where you bring greetings from the church to the church you're attending at that time. I think that'd be pretty cool, don't you? I think that now that we're online, I think the pastor from the other church would be like, why were you at that church? No, but anyway, so they're hanging out there. And those were some of the, the main reasons, the collection, he was going to encourage and equip these leaders because if he created, you know, well, he didn't, God created, but through Paul created all these kind of subcultures of churches, then he's got to have a leader there to kind of continue the work, right? You want to leave some, some witness behind. So. We read that he decided to go back to Macedonia, and he was accompanied by, and you're welcome to read through all those names at whatever convenience you would like, and some of the places they traveled along the way. And so that's what was happening as they sailed. Now, they stopped in Troas, a place called Troas, and one of the cool, coolest stories in Acts from my perspective, because it's one of those stories where it's just out of the blue. It doesn't really talk about anything special or crazy, just the circumstances. And we read about how on the first day of the week, they came together to break bread. Now, you may want to mark this in your Bible. This is the first time that we ever read about Christians gathering, not on the Sabbath, but on Sunday. They talk about meeting on the first day of the week, which is, and they're breaking bread, which for that at that time represented both communion or the sacrament but it also represented a love feast that they would have together i always thought it was sacrament and love feast but some of my reading has said it might have been the reverse i don't think it makes a difference which way it went but it, that that was happening this is the first time we see of christians purposely gathering on the first day of the week on sunday for worship now I, I'm going to take a small little tangent just to get some creative juices flowing and then get us thinking a little bit, make sure I'm not doing all the talking. There are, go ahead. I was going to say, you skip, you just read through the other day, but when we start on verse 6, where it says, but we sailed away, that's a good point. Paul can say that's, that's where Luke, right. Luke is the one that brought this first Yes, that's true. And we're, and we're going to see how Luke was needed in this next section. That's good. Because that, Luke's part, remember, Luke wrote Luke and Acts. It's like a two-part journal he wrote. Okay. Now, there are some believers that think that you should only gather for worship on Saturday. Have you ever heard of Seventh-day Adventist churches? They're specifically ones who say we are called to gather on the Sabbath that never should have changed, that that was the day of creation and we should do that. And they actually believe, I wouldn't say that they would say Christians who gather on Sunday are, are not saved, but they would say you're dead wrong and in sin. 
because we're supposed to gather on Saturday. And this is what they say, because Sunday is named after the sun god Saturn or Saturnius or something like that. All right. So they say we're not going to gather on a Sunday on a day that was claimed with the name of a false god. Now, how would you respond to someone who had such a outside? I mean, let's be honest, as Christians, we come across some different opinions on things, but that's not one you come across that often, is it? So how would you even begin to not so much defend, but discuss that kind of topic? Because they're pretty much saying that you're in sin for coming here on Sunday morning. How would you approach an argument with that or a discussion? Yeah. I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Sun, sun was named after the sun. Sunday was named after the sun wor worshiping the sun god. And I, I made a mistake. You caught me on that. Thank you. And Saturday was named after. That was how you begin the argument. Saturday was named after the Saturn or the god of the planet Saturn. And so, yeah. And so now, how else would you discuss an argument about this? No, they were on Saturday. Saturday was the day of rest. Yeah, Saturday was the day of rest. And see, and, and this, just so, what's that? Yeah, so sundown. Sundown on Saturday, but really they considered it Saturday. And that's something to think about is, believe it or not, according to Scripture, Christians don't worship on the Sabbath. So when it says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy in the Old Testament, the Sabbath is Sunday. It was the day of rest God created. Sunday is a different day than that, Right? Now, Christians try to take that and put it on top. Now, I'm messing with your brains right now, aren't I? So, good, good. You're like, I had a hard day at work. I don't need all this. Anyway, but we'll give it to you anyway. Can I see your hand up, Greg? Oh, now you don't want to talk now that I brought that up. Yeah, all of a sudden, we don't want to talk. That's just it. That's just it, is as Christians, we understand the Sabbath day is the day where God rested, where God's, God said creation is complete. Sunday is the day where we say redemption is complete. And so that's why we worship. But I just thought I did a little bit of my kind of weird tangent research to share with you. I don't know if this will be of interest to you or not, but I'm going to pretend it is. So we mentioned that Saturday, the name, or the name Sunday was named after worship of the sun God. Saturday was named after Saturn, Saturn worship of, of Saturnalia, sort of the Saturn god. Do you know that Tuesday was named after the German god Tiu, the god of war? Wednesday was named after a famous Marvel character. Anyone know? Wednesday, the daughter of the Adams family. No. <laughs> no, not the Adams family. No. <laughs> The ancient Nordic tribes did not pronounce his name Odin. They pronounced it with a W, Woden. That's how they pronounced it. And that's where the name Wednesday came from. I think this one, this one will be easy. Thursday is? Thor's Day. Thank you. It's good to have someone who knows what they're talking about. Why you know so much about other religions concerns me. But no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding with you, Sally. Just kidding with you. No, because it's helpful to know. But so Wednesday is Wooden's Day or, or Odin's Day. Thursday is Thor's Day. Friday you may not know as well, but there was a goddess in the uh, Norwegian culture or the Scandinavian culture named Frida. Frigga or Frida. And that's where Friday, she was the goddess of love. And then just so you know, Monday was also known as the Moon Day or Mana Day. And that's what, so all of them are named after things like that. Just like July is named after Julius Caesar. Just like August is named after Caesar Augustus. And so what I love is when I was thinking about all this, this one verse came to mind. And you're welcome to mark it down if you want, but you can just listen if you want. In the book of Romans which I'll get to quick enough. Paul has this to say in Romans chapter 12. Is it chapter 12? I think I got it wrong. Give me a second here. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> oh, darn it. Where is it? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Oh, darn it. I can't remember where I put it. 
No, I did not know that. I know. <laughs> All right. All right, well, I'm going to have to apologize because I'm having trouble finding it right now. But, uh, darn it. There's a set of verses right around the, the end section of Romans that talks where Paul says uh, how we should not honor one day among another. That some people honor this day, some people honor that day. That it doesn't matter. And it's the same argument where he says, and some people say you should abstain from this food, others people enjoy that food. Let each people do as they please, but above all, follow the will of God. And so he talks about how these different holy days and these different things are at your, your pleasure to, yes, you got it? 14.5, I just skipped right over. I said I had 14, 14, how did I miss it? All right, there it is. Thank you. One man considers one day more sacred than the other. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in their own mind. He who regards one day as special does so uh, to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God, and he who abstains does so for the Lord. So none of us lives or dies for themselves. We do it for the Lord. So if Charlie decides to fast for three days, and I decide to feast at Moe's Five Guys and Olive Garden for three days, we both do it under the Lord, brother. Sound good? All right, that sounds good to me. So... In other words, we shouldn't get caught up on some of the petty little things. There are Christians who will fight and argue with you because they believe Christmas is a pagan holiday founded on pagan things. And they will say that Easter was a pagan holiday to the goddess Astareth, who, or Istra, Istra, who on, on for Easter and the, the goddess of fertility. I believe every day is the Lord's and that every day can be claimed for him. And I, my, what I often argue with these people, I say, so is it wrong for us to gather and worship the God of the incarnation? Well, no, it's not. So does it matter what day we choose to do so? And so we choose December 25th, except some of the, the Orthodox Church actually goes by the Julian calendar, and they celebrate Christmas on January 7th, on January 7th. So they just had Christmas, and they're moving into Epiphany. So anyway, the biggest thing is that we understand that are we doing what we do unto the Lord? Please. Hey. I don't know the answer to that. When did it split? I assume they didn't split it when Jesus split it, and so that's probably when it got different, I would imagine. Okay. Yeah, I can't answer that. I don't. I don't know about the Jewish. Yeah, I don't know about the Jewish calendar. All I can guess is that it may have more or less days, and so it, then it gets off from where we are. But that's just a guess. Sorry, that, that one I can't tell you. So now you have your homework assignment to bring back to us. I have a good. I go to the ancient Greek called Google, and you can probably find that answer for yourself. So uh, <laughs> I saw one little funny video where the pastor quoted something and the guy had a funny look and everybody started checking on their phones to see if he was right. And I thought, but I like that. I go, I go for that. So, all right. So we're back to chapter 20 and we're moving on to this really cool story about the first day of the week when they gathered together for the breaking of bread. Paul spoke to the people and, beca and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept talking. And that makes sense, right? I don't know if you've ever been to like these big like promise keeper conferences or Christian conferences. Normally the last night is the one that just goes on and on as if the time frame doesn't matter many of the times. And that was the idea. Is Paul knew he was going to leave these godly people and he had to leave as much in the you know, download as much into them as he could before he left. I'd like to get back to that. Yeah, I'd like to get back to that. What do you say? <laughs> One thing I'm pretty sure of is I can out-preach most people's ability to sit. <laughs> not everybody's, not everybody's, but most people. So, all right. Um, so they, they, they kept talking until midnight. Now just think about for a moment, I like to kind of get into the scripture sometimes. They're in this upper room, 
You have to assume that they didn't have air conditioning, right? You assume that it might have been kind of stuffy. Did they light things with electricity? Of course not. What did they use? Candles, and they were burning oil, which could create a stuffy feeling in the room. So you got this stuff. I mean, it's bad enough when we get those lights, you know, that you sit in a, uh, like a classroom and they start to go kind of numb to them. Can you imagine just hour after hour hearing Paul talk and you want to listen, but you just start dozing off, right? I mean, and to be honest, this fellow Eutychus, the term used here means he was probably somewhere between 8 and 15. So maybe a little younger than a teenager or a teenager. And there were many lamps in the upstairs, and they were meeting. Seated in a room was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. Is it a sin to fall asleep in church? Is it evil to fall asleep in church? Is it wrong to fall asleep in church? Now, when you paused on a little bit, right? Go ahead, James. You're allowed to disagree with the group. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're... So you're looking at a best of all circumstances idea, right? The assuming you should be able to get some good night's sleep, get to bed, wake up, be ready to go. In other words, treat church as a priority and be prepared for it, almost like you go into an interview with, that kind of thing. That, that is, that's the other side of it. And, and I'll be frank, when my brother Tony, who's what, 90? 90 plus sits there. I am just glad he came to join us. And most Sundays he makes it pretty far, but not all the way. And I'm good with that. And I am even that way with any with adults or teenagers. I would rather they're here and fall asleep knowing they made the effort to be part of the church community than just stay home with the 98% of all the others and just say, I don't feel it coming. Right, right. Right, right. And so that's why I'm saying that though I agree fully with what Shelley said, that we should do our best to prepare and be ready to come to church awake and ready to go and staying up all night watching Netflix or whatever else you're watching is not a reason to be tired at church. I do say I would rather someone was here fatigued and even sleepy than, the, than made that effort than, than not be here at all. And there are times I think we all know when it's just rough to stay awake. For whatever reason, we've just got a lot going on in our lives, and we come here. It might be the first time we slowed down all day, and we're just tired. And we just. Yeah, see, I really don't think that's the case. I, I... For those of you online, he said it was my message. And so. <laughs> mm hmm. to relax and put it down yep, yep. now if they snore you can give them a little nudge but you know. what's that it could just get in subconsciously absolutely and, and we all know there's times when we wake up and fall asleep to the radio or tv and we kind of remember what we heard so shelly were you gonna say something So I guess, I guess what I'm saying is I, I don't think we should ever look down on someone, young or old, that fell asleep in church because they've made the effort. Now, if, if a young person does that every single week, I would follow up just to make sure they might have sleep apnea or if they're using their time properly. But as a whole, I think we should just be thankful that, that people are here and a part of it. Amen? Now, we could go all Orthodox Church, and this isn't true of all Orthodox churches, but they will have a two-hour service, and you are expected to stand for the entire service. 
Now they have seats in the back for the, the elderly, so they say, but anybody my, you're standing the whole time. I got a back problem. Deal with it. Pray. <laughs> now in fairness, they're always up, down, kneel, stand, sit down, so that, but they don't sit. And so anyway, that is, what's that? I've actually thought about putting in the communion uh, right, there is a place for it. And I've actually thought about inviting people to either sit or kneel. And so it's funny you mentioned that. We did it at my previous church. There was an option and people, some took that. So anyway, any other thoughts on that? I didn't want to tangent on that too much. I just thought we'd have fun talking about it a little bit. Uh-oh. <laughs> Being a parent? If you know your kids stayed up all night and that's why they're tired because they were on video games, I'd whack them and say, stay awake. I'm honest. If I knew that was true, one of my boys, they were sitting there, I'd probably walk down, put my hand on their shoulder, tap them a little bit and just keep preaching, you know? So, yeah, that, that's a parenting issue, not a pastor issue. Or you could just make them sit right in front of the pulpit up on the stage. That'll keep them awake. Yeah, that's very different because the parent knows the inner workings of the person. And so it's kind of like if you lead someone to know Jesus Christ and in their prayer, they say, Lord, I'm effed up and they start swearing. You know, that's an honest prayer from that person. God will work on the other stuff as they mature in Christ. You're just glad that they're giving themselves to Christ. You don't come to Christ perfected. Amen. Amen. On the inside by him, yes. But as far as the outward actions, it's a work in progress. So. All right. Any other thoughts or questions, disagreements? You're welcome to disagree with me. That's perfectly fine. I've fallen asleep to many. I have fallen asleep to many. Have you ever been in a church? Just and sit there and you're just like trying to shake yourself awake, drink some cold water, do whatever it takes. It does. It does. Okay. There are once in a while where I'll see people doing that, and then I'll use them in an illustration during the sermon, and then they, they perk up real quick. So uh, I've only done it a few times, but in youth ministry, I did it all the time. But all right, you guys are tangenting us. It's all on you. All right. Um, seated in the windows, Eutychus, uh, Paul went, talked on and on, and as he uh, was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Who wrote the book of Acts? And what was his profession? So he knew if he was dead or not, right? Yes. He wasn't in a coma. Luke called him dead. And Luke was a physician. <laughs> he, we may know more as physicians now than they did then, but they knew dead. Can we agree with that? They knew dead. Okay. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. You ever wonder if Paul said that before he came back to life? Or after he came back. I mean, either way, it's just totally amazing, isn't it? But just, I don't know at what point the alive happened. Did he speak it in faith and it happened? Yeah, he was saying it as... We can say something, Greg? That's where I'm going, yeah. Because if you remember in the Old Testament, will you tell... Well, I'll tell a story just because I have a microphone and people... Yep. Right, right, right. And so that same ability to, to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. So just as Elijah in the Old Testament uh, laid down on the child, which we don't recommend as a ministry philosophy here at all, that breaks a lot of rules, but that's what he did. The Lord had him do that, and he raised him from the dead, okay? Are you all right there, bro? That Mountain Dew, it does stuff to you, and you wonder where I get all my energy. My goodness. So anyway, this was a powerful moment because... Paul was talking to believers right now, right? Can you imagine the encouragement and amen on what he was teaching when this, this young man, more than likely because of his age, his family was there. He was probably known by others in the community. And to have him fall three stories down and then for Paul to just pick him up and God to bring him back to life. What an incredible moment. In, in scriptures and it just it makes me chuckle because Luke writes it like this is just everyday life you notice that he doesn't say into everyone's amazement he says no Paul just put his hands on him raised him a dead this was spiritual normal life back then just very exciting then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate 
and, ta- and talking until daylight. <laughs> Notice it didn't stop the preacher. I like that. I don't know about you. I like that. Guy dies. Let's just raise him and get back to work. Didn't stop the preacher. Keep him going. The people took the young man home alive, and they were greatly comforted. Just what a tremendous story of Eutychus. And it does encourage us as preachers that if people fall asleep when you're preaching, they even fell asleep on Paul. So I'm in good company then. All right. (laughs) He certainly had a good leg up to do so. Uh, You're right, we don't know. The fact that he was with other Christian leaders, you would hope so. But as you know, each person chooses their own path in life. And so, yeah, yep. All right, where are we at? 36, okay. Verse 13, we went ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos, where we were going to to take Paul aboard. Remember, Luke's talking about this. And so he had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. When we met, when he met us at Assos, we took him aboard and went to, uh, Mylena. The next day we sailed. I'm just going to skip through this. They sailed to a bunch of places. Got it? Okay. We can break down those places over time, but just little islands and stuff that he. And why was he sailing to those places and not just a straight shot? To pick up, to, to stop in these different places to get their offering and often those offerings with people bringing those offerings. And so, yes, that's why he was stopping all along the way and making his, you know, Paul decided to sail past Ephesus, as we said, he isn't going back there, to avoid spending time in the providence of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if, if, if possible, by Pentecost. When he goes to Ephesus, a lot of good stuff happens, but a lot of persecution happens. And he did not want to be slowed down. So that whole first section of this we just read, he sailed west, came back, and did all these pickup stops along the way, and now he's off to Jerusalem. Any questions before we continue? We're good? All right. So we're on the boat with Paul and Luke and everybody else. Uh, From Letus, Paul sent, uh, sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I have lived the whole time as I was with you from the day I first came into the providence of Asia. Now this is really neat. Because Paul isn't just talking about what he preached. He is talking about the life and the way and the character he had, the ethics he lived by in front of them. And it's a great reminder to us that people are watching the way we live as Christians. But they are observing the way we handle situations. Certainly none of us have gotten all the certain situations perfected. But at the same time, God is calling us to be light, not just with our words, but with the way we lived. And Paul had lived years with these people. And so he's referring back to how they saw him live. He said, I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears. What do you think the tears are referring to? We all know what humility means. He means he served humbly before the Lord. But he says, end with tears. The Greek word here for tears is tears. <laughs> so, does that answer your question? <laughs> tears, of tears of joy come with, with being touched by the Lord. Yep. Yeah. Okay, But what could we argue the same motivation of love was behind either form of those tears? Tears of sorrow or tears of joy? I'm, I'm asking, I'm asking. Can, you, can we agree with that? Like, the expression might be different, but the motivation comes from the same love. Terry? Tears from pain. Right. And I'm sure that broke his heart, seeing other Jewish leaders who he wanted to see. Remember in the Bible, he said, I would consider myself broken off from Christ if it meant all of my brethren could come to know him. Those aren't just words. He was allowed to write those in what's now the Bible. So God, amen, that thought, that he felt that strongly about those people he cared about. Are you going to say something, Greg? That struggle, back and forth. And so... When he, he was a man who didn't simply want to preach for his own platform, 
but he truly loved the people he was ministering to. He, he wasn't just an evangelist and a teacher, but he was a pastor to these people. He wanted to shepherd them and love them. And with tears, I think a lot of the tears, I think you all have covered it, but I, I think a lot of those tears came out in prayer also as he prayed for people that he cared about. And he said, although I was severely tested by the plot of the Jews, and we've read through many of those, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from house to house. <clears throat> this is something that, this is one of my pet peeves of modern evangelists. May I share it with you? Good, because I was going to. So, <laughs> we live in a world where it's all about the big speaker, the man on the stage, you know, the man with the plan up front, you know, doing all this. Paul, and of course Jesus, give us a much different model. Not that I think there's anything wrong by any stretch by standing on a stage and proclaiming the gospel. But these same men were found going house to house, loving, caring, praying, teaching. It wasn't about the stage. I mean, we learned there was an amphitheater that Paul spoke in pretty much every day regularly. But he still cared enough about each individual and not about the ministry. He cared about each individual enough that he would go house to house to try to lead him to the Lord. It's one of the things that drew me uh, to the uh, uh, more modern evangelist Charles Finney's ministry. It was in the 1800s where, yeah, he would speak in large churches and large crowds, but afterwards he would go from house to house whenever people wanted to talk to him about what he had shared or wanted to know more about God. He wasn't too big to go and hang out with the, ra the rest of the rabble. And, so, and I just think that's a great sign of a, a man or woman of God. That it's not all about the bigness of the ministry, but about the individual people that they want to minister to. And so, anyway, I had to get that off my chest a little bit there. So, all right. Uh, da, 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 da. I just, I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that I must, they must turn. What were the two points of emphasis? Without looking, what were the two points of emphasis in Paul's messages? Repent. And have faith in Christ. That were the two key points. And as I've shared with you before, when John the Baptist broke on the scene, what did he scream? Repent. When Jesus started his ministry, what did he say? Repent. And what word are we afraid to mention in many modern churches? Repent. And yet we turn away from now. Believe me, repent can be presented in a very rude, obnoxious way. Pointing a finger at somebody thinking you're better than them. So it's not the word itself, but the word itself means come, turn around, and go in a different direction than the way you're living now. That's what, how the word repent is defined. So you're going one way away from God, turn around and come back to Him. And so repentance is a vital part of the Christian life. Thankfully, once we repent and come to Christ, we don't have to repent again, right? Oh, wait a minute. No, wrong? Wrong. No, you're right. You're right that, that it's wrong. And, and we, we need to remember that because one of the wonderful things of getting cleansed is being cleansed through repentance and God showing us how he can do that for us and it builds our faith. So just note that just like Jesus, just like John the Baptist, Paul emphasized repentance and walking in faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the two key things he wanted to remind them to emphasize also. All right. Should we try to finish? Yeah, why not? And now, compelled by the Spirit. This word compelled means bound. Meaning, God had such a hold of him, it was as if he had no other choice. He had a choice, but it's as if he had no other choice but to do what the Spirit said. He said, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns that prisons and hardships are facing me. <clears throat> Question for all of you. There are many good, godly preachers, teachers, Christian writers who believe that Paul missed God's plan because he was so set on going to Jerusalem that God was constantly warning him not to go there because of the persecution and eventual death he would face in the process. What do you think?
Mm -hmm. Well, then why did God tell him? It says, in every city I went to, I'm warned that persecutions and so forth. Why, why did God even warn him? Okay, well, here's one. Do you think that's helpful to have God warn you what's coming? I love it. I hear you no know from this side, and I see Charlie. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> it's going to make you go anyway. So you'd rather all just be... Okay, there you go. Yeah. You make a good point. There's going to be persecutions. You're probably like, and? <laughs> What's your point? <laughs> and does it say that if he chose to go somewhere else, there wouldn't be persecution? Right. So you make a great, I didn't even thought of that. Too, that really anywhere he was going to go, because he's Paul, there's probably going to be persecution, right? Yeah, Terry. He knew. So, can we come to a consensus that Paul understood the consequences and yet said, "Yes, Lord, I'll go." It could be that, that that was that's that that's my discernment of this too. Because it's interesting. Because in the book of Philippians, which remember is written after this part, he says, "Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel." Uh, as a result, it has become clear to me throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And people came to Christ because of these chains. That's how he viewed the chains. He didn't view them as, oh, woe is me. He viewed them as, you don't get it. Because of these, they now are in the kingdom of God. And that's a pretty wild way. Now, my question for you, and I, there is no, this is one of those fun ones, but there's no definite, definite answer for this. Why does God not more frequently prepare us for tragedies that would come. Example, if God would have told me, when you go to Jacksonville to minister at Christ Church, I'm going to create, oh, not I, but there's going to be a giant plague that hits the United States that's going to cause your congregation, your physical congregation on Sunday to shrink. Some, some will stay online. And it starts to tell me all the things that are going to happen. Some of the most wonderful members of your congregation, they're going to lose their lives. If he went and told me all of this stuff, do you think I would have been just as excited to come? I might have said, you know, Lord, Arizona was interesting. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you start, what I'm saying is I think if God would often tell us what was coming, that we would run from it. Yes, but I'd be amazed at the prophecy. I wouldn't be pleased with the prophecy, but I'd be amazed with the... <laughs> so that's what I should have done. My first week I got here, I said, by the way, there's going to be a horrible plague that hits the United States. That would have been pretty uh, well received. Save some money. So, Save some money. But my point that I'm trying to get to is... I believe God sometimes can't tell us because we will run from it. And he, now, I believe there are times he protects us from it too. It's not that God always wants negative to happen to us. But, but throughout the Bible, there is time after time when God talks about testing and refining of it. If you remember in Jeremiah, he says, See, I will refine and test them for what else can I do? You go to the book Malachi, and he says, Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand in it when he appears? He will be, God will be like a refiner's fire. He will sit at the refiner and purify, like we purify silver, he will purify his people. And then he also says in Zechariah, in chapter, what was it? Chapter 13, verse 9. Uh, this, this third I will, bring in, I will bring in the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. And they will call on my name and they will answer me. And in the book of James, it talks about testing us. And the testing of our faith develops what? Perseverance. So it is a New Testament concept that God will lovingly 
refine us. It's almost as if you had a piece of wood that had, you know, is all you get splinters and everything else, and you just run that sander on it over and over and over until it's so smooth that you can just run your hand on it, and there's no more splinters on that wood. It's that way that God wants to work with us, and that's not an amen or something you put on the back of a, ca- a Christmas card, but it's the truth that God disciplines those He loves. Book of Hebrews. He disciplines those of us he loves. And Paul had captured that concept when he said, however I consider my life worth nothing, if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus Christ has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. I was thinking of an illustration for this. Oh, here, go ahead, son. Mm -hmm. right right it's it's always interesting when you think about that he knows the beginning from the end and he knew paul would say that and paul would feel that so he had already had it prepared which is why he knew he could tell paul and that it would still go in that direction because he was that's good yes y'all They had that, I wouldn't say it was a whole network, but it was kind of a network. When he was uh, imprisoned in a house church in Rome, people would regularly bring him things. Whether that was true for those that were in the depths of the Roman prison, I don't know. From what I remember of Roman society, I want to say yes, because I, I remember seeing some, some uh, what's it called? Uh, st- ah. What's it called when you see a movie, but it's like about history? Documentary, thank you. I remember seeing documentaries where I remember seeing that happen, but at the same time, I'm not 100% sure that that's what they did. But uh, yeah, it's that idea that they would bring him things and take care of him and, and so forth. Yeah. You mentioned about God, that God would get warned as a part of the history. God does get warned if you get to the wise men who were the. Yeah. Way to bring Epiphany in there. That's good stuff, man. Mm-hmm. He does give warnings. And, 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 and our goal is to be the type of people that can receive the warning but not run from what he's telling us to do. And that, so you're right on. Yeah. Tread lightly and carry a big stick. No. <laughs> yeah. And I think we all have testimony to that. Not to maybe not to that extent, obviously, but we all have moments in our lives that seemed overwhelming, but by the grace of God helping us get through those times. And so why would it be any different in those moments when we're feeling heavy persecution for whatever, for whatever the situation is? In other words, our God has consistently shown us that's how he is. That's what his character is. That's good. It's really good. Oh yeah, well, there was a, 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 a there was an ancient saying. Were you going to say it? The ancient saying: the blood, the, the, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The idea that churches that are persecuted heavily often have a tremendous growth. I know that I've read. I, th- I think I may have mentioned to you. If I did, I'm sorry. But in, in then a number of Muslim countries where the Muslims are militant against the Christians, there's nominal Muslims who are being drawn to Christ because of the testimony of the church amidst the persecution. Does that mean we pray for persecution? Not once do I ever read of anyone in the Bible praying to be persecuted. That's foolishness. But we do ask for the grace to withstand it if God wants to bring whatever he wants to bring. And so the illustration I had for this, I just thought was a fun one. 
and we'll kind of end with this unless anybody has any questions, is I don't know how many of you ever watched the show American Gladiators growing up. That was where they used to shoot balls at each other. It was, just, it was a pretty cool, it was pretty much a guy show, but it was, it was a cool show. And they would set up these obstacle courses that these, these uh, people had to run, these men had to run, and they were racing each other, and they would have two doors. But they weren't doors, they were more like made out of, I guess, a, a thick paper. And they would run and smash through one of the doors. And on one of the doors, there was nothing. And you just kept running right through to the end of the obstacle. On the other one, you encountered a 250-pound muscle-bound man who s tried to stop you. So they're diving through it, and one of them would go right through, and the other one would be like, ugh, <laughs> just hit that guy. And I thought, we would all always choose which door. Because we think that's the way to win. When sometimes God's plan to win he may let others choose that door, but he's going to ask us to go through the harder one because he knows that he will give us the grace to withstand it and that through it he'll receive more glory. Because again, that's, the, that's how Paul saw and summed it up. He said, if I may finish the race, complete the task of the Lord Jesus Christ has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel. And it was a verse like this if you were uh, at uh, our wonderful friend Charlie's funeral that I ended my sermon with because his life reminded me of it. I have run the race. I have kept the faith. And that's what we're called to do and called to be. So, all right. Well, the next section of chapter 20 in Acts is a section where Paul is going to give some really great teaching to a bunch of Christian elders. It's really the only time in all of, all of Paul's writings that we see him pulling aside elders and giving direct teaching to them with it being written down. I mean, we just read about how he taught um, all night and stuff, but we're going to have the writing. We have it written down for us. So. I look forward to seeing all of you next week. And for those of you that watched online, thank you for joining us.